Well, good morning. So let me uh, say a few words of the, what we're going to do in this uh, session. Uh, actually, the idea was to combine uh, policy planners and think tankers. I happen to myself to ha have been the first uh, director of the French uh, policy planning staff in the French Foreign Ministry. That was in the 70s. And I have founded IFRI uh, in the late 70s, 1979. So I have, if I may say so, the two sides uh, of the business. Uh, what do we have in common, the policy planners and the think tankers? Now, if you go back to the First World War, uh, at the time, uh, nothing like that, like that existed. And uh, the people who thought and talked about international affairs were usually uh, either historians or journalists. Journalists with a special interest, of course, and journalists traveling uh, around. Uh, but uh, the, the, after the First World War, there was an understanding that there should be people whose job, whose profession, would be to study contemporary affairs uh, in much more depth. And that was the foundations of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in New York, New York, Chatham House in the UK, etc., etc. And uh, therefore, the business of policy planners combining knowledge of history, geography, but also a deep understanding of current uh, issues, also introducing social sciences and so forth and so on. All this started to develop after the First World War. And uh, think tanks, uh, actually we're talking of think tanks, uh, not of policy <laughs> planning. Policy planning started, in fact, with the Second World War, especially in the US and the Department of State, for instance, with George Kennan, and so forth and so on. What do we have in common? We have the same kind of experts, we, but the, our publics are slightly different, because if you are a policy planner, you work for a minister, for the ministry, or you work for uh, uh, the president of the republic, or whoever, depending on the country. Uh, think tankers have four targets. They think they aim at influencing states, governments, your own government, but possibly others as well, media, business community, and academics. And the two need one another. They feed one another, policy planners and think tankers. And sometimes are the same people who move from one to the other. So the idea of the uh, meeting of this uh, session this morning is to exchange some uh, experience between policy planners and think tankers. And we have uh, chosen three uh, topics, one uh, being the issue of multilateralism, which is, of course, very much at the center of this uh, peace uh, forum. And uh, the second uh, part, we'll, we will discuss the relation with the media, that's Yuri Rubinsky. And uh, the third one will be uh, to go in more depth on the distinction between policy planners and think tankers, as I have tried to briefly uh, discuss it. So uh, I uh, suggest that we uh, start now with the first uh, sub-session. Uh, and uh, for that, I will call uh, Stuart Patrick, who is, so you, I think you are on the right or the left? You decide to be on the right. That's fine, I know, because you know, there are two options. Either the policy planner is on the right and the, the think tanker on the left, or the other way around. And it doesn't matter. So 
let's say that Stuart Patrick, Stuart Patrick is the director of the International Institutions and Global Governance Program at the American, at the New York Council and for New York and Washington, actually, uh, Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, he runs an extremely important uh, program to that effect. And he is in charge, in particular, of the Council of Council uh, uh, Initiative, of which uh, IFRI is a partner. And uh, I will call on uh, Mr. Khalid Al Khatter. Uh, who is the director of the policy planning staff of Qatar. So I will ask uh, each of them to speak. Uh, we agreed, you know, five minutes and 43 seconds okay. uh, to introduce the subject, and then there will be a few minutes for Q's and A's. Fantastic. So. Um, Merci. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thierry. Uh, we are very privileged at the Council on Foreign Relations to have uh, Thierry de Montbrial as a member of what we call the Council of Councils, which is an international network of think tanks that is roughly equivalent in its membership in terms of the countries uh, to the G20 and is another example of why we need to think more multilaterally. I just want to say a few words about um, uh, think tanks and then some of the challenges that they face in this very difficult and turbulent environment. Uh, first of all, this is a very timely um, event. Um, it's timely for a number of reasons. One, we're obviously commemorating uh, the end, the centenary of the armistice, um, and there were a lot of decisions based on ideas that were made back then, uh, were ideas often that were not challenged, and there were not enough people speaking truth to power uh, back then. Another uh, point is that um, it was also uh, an era in which some of the first think tanks, including Council on Foreign Relations and Chatham House, were created. Um, we also are facing an, an environment where we need to have new ideas for new challenges. At times of turbulence is one of the a few times where you actually get rece receptivity to new ideas, and so think tanks have a tremendous role to play, particularly when there is an assault on facts going on. At their best, think tanks can influence policy in a number of ways. The most important one, of course, is by serving as the ideas industry. Uh, my colleague from Qatar and, and the rest of the policy planners will be no doubt aware of what we call the tyranny of the inbox, the fact that policy planners are simply too uh, preoccupied with uh, the, the crises of the day, that their long-range thinking, the, 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 uh, the idea, the, the mandate to, as George Kennan was told by George Marshall, to avoid trivia, too frequently they get dragged back into the trivia, and I think uh, think tankers do that. Think tanks also provide uh, new talent in the form of the revolving door between think tanks and government. Uh, they often play a, a traditional convening role that is very important, and some of that convening is at a very informal level, which can be extraordinarily useful, sometimes even in secret. Um, there's also uh, examples of think tanks. One thinks of the apartheid struggle in uh, South Africa. They played a very important track to convening role, and we've seen that also uh, in uh, the issue of, uh, of the Arab-Israeli uh, peace, um, uh, peace process. But, we, but think tanks, I think it's fair to say, have an enormously difficult environment right now, and I just want to uh, uh, discuss some of the challenges. The major question is how think tanks can retain relevance and, and impact uh, in a, a populist era in which people are skeptical of experts and expertise, where advice uh, is, is dismissed, and we live in a world that is absolutely awash in data and information. As uh, we discussed in our last Council of Councils meeting, there are many organizations out there calling themselves think tanks. They're in effect charlatans. They are not experts. They are people with uh, access to the media. Uh, they are the mouthpieces of very narrow interest groups, moneyed interests. And so the question is, to, to, to fight back against this, particularly in this age, the think tankers need to have access to uh, safeguarding their independence. Um, they need to try to, um, keep their focus on speaking truth to power, doing what we call in the United States, calling balls and strikes as if they're an umpire in a baseball game. Uh, but they also need to do more than that, uh, but beyond creating top-notch, independent, analytical, defensible, uh, policy-relevant analysis. They need to get beyond elites. This is something that has been very difficult for the Council on Foreign Relations to do, but we're starting to do it. Uh, rather than just speaking to the establishment, we actually need to speak to uh, more mass populations and help with civic ed education. 
We also need to exploit new technologies uh, that deal with, that, that are appropriate to the digital age and to digital natives. Uh, too often we have been sp uh, spending time working on, um, well, books are important and we will continue to do that, but we need to have books plus. And then the final thing, and this relates to um, the Council of Councils initiative that we've launched, and there are other initiatives like the Think Tank 20, for instance. We live in a world where solutions must be multilateral, and so we helped create an international network of think tanks that spans the countries of the East and the West, the global North and the South, and we come together, and then we debate matters of common interest, major global challenges, and then we take, try to drive down to solutions that are policy relevant and that can be communicated to policymakers, and that's what we hope to do uh, going forward. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Stuart. You didn't talk much about multilateralism, but it was implicit in the whole of your presentation, so thank you very much. Now we will turn, I will switch to, uh, uh, to Dr. Uh, Khalid, and uh, maybe I don't know what you have prepared, but what I think many of us would like to hear from you is how you do currently in your job, uh, with uh, the very difficult uh, situation of Qatar uh, in the spirit of multilateralism. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an important question. Uh, thank you first uh, for inviting me and uh, this opportunity also to speak uh, to, to the audience and to present, to present our views. Of course, uh, I think it's an important uh, issue here as the policy department was established uh, just before the Gulf crisis. And uh, um, I think this Paris, of course, the first Paris Peace Forum emphasizes the issue you just mentioned, the importance of international cooperation and collective problem solving, encountering global challenges and ensuring durable peace. Um, we have engaged through this uh, last the period since the inception of, of, of uh, the policy planning department and the advent of the crisis with think tanks uh, specifically and more so with think tanks which are more in, in, in uh, the Beltway in Washington and the United States. And so some of my comments come from these kind of engagements um, over the last year and they reflect on some think tanks actually and some trends, but of course it's, it's, it doesn't reflect on, on all think tanks. So um, think tanks are playing an increasingly important role in setting agendas for policy making. And this session gives an important recognition to this issue. The decline of collective efforts and international institutional cooperation has eroded trust between states. This has led to a series of crises and conflicts that not only threaten the stability of the wider world, but in my region in particular. The breakdown of trust in the Middle East is a central challenge that we need to collectively address. Take, for example, the ongoing blockade initiated against Qatar in June 2017. Qatar and the three blockading countries, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, have actually been members of the Gulf Cooperation Council since it was founded nearly 40 years ago. This did not, however, stop the three, these three countries, members of the GCC, taking unilateral and illegal action against another member state. This is why we in Qatar warned in the early days of the blockade that this unjustifiable action and threat to Qatar's sovereignty should not be condoned and that it would have wider implication for the region. While countries like France, Germany, and other European countries and the US government have called for negotiated resolution uh, to the blockade, a number of irreputable think tanks have been implicated in perpetuating the Gulf crisis. It is this crisis that has turned the spotlight on some think tanks that have tarnished the image of the think tank scene in general. In general, this leads me to highlight three central weaknesses with some think tanks, which we have noticed actually in engaging through the crisis. First is the fundamental problem that some think tanks continue to advocate around the liberal assumption 
of progress for the Middle East when in fact it is, has, it has been proved a failure. In this sense, think tanks, and I think this also reflects maybe more the academic literature, I think that the uh, studies on the Middle East, if you remember, for example, 11th of September and thereafter, that events, a lot of Middle East departments in uh, universities, universities address the issue that, well, we've been studying the region for so long, but we have also failed really to understand it sufficiently. I think this Gulf crisis is also still a manifestation of this. I think there still needs to be revisiting a lot of these assumptions. Um, so this makes them susceptible to regimes um, uh, that position themselves as advocates of liberal ideas. And we have seen this actually how think tanks brought into some of the narratives of the region. And, have the, how they have, and how they have been actually pulled in the same direction. So this has been a big problem for the region. Second, it has became, became clear that some think tanks have gradually moved from being independent, trusted sources of expertise to that of paid lobbyists peddling partisan positions and political uh, positions of uh, external actors. Third, some regimes in the region have also used their outsized financial leverage over such think tanks to bend policy against their foes, even if it works against the national interest of decision makers and the countries involved, those of the think tanks, uh, uh, where the think tanks are actually. This aspect of think tanks seen has negative consequences for the Middle East, which is marred in conflict and instability, and needs a new approach and momentum. We all agree that the time has come for such think tanks to engage in a, a, a new approach. First, think tanks have to begin to address systematic problems of short-termism, especially with respect to policy recommendation. Second, think tanks should be thought uh, should be thought of as leaders, not camp followers. So they need to take the initiative again and not to buy in uh, uh, prevailing narratives or narratives that are espoused by certain countries. They need to identify projects for change, not only at the level of policy, but in terms of challenging assumptions that if left unchecked are leading us into further crises. Third, uh, ethical norms of impartiality and objectivity must be reestablished for all think tanks. In this important Paris Peace Conference, it is important that we re-energize the role of think tanks for a new era in the Middle East. To this end, I'm pleased to give a head up that the Qatar Foreign Ministry will soon launch a new initiative under the theme of Hikaya, navigating narratives and policy in the Middle East with the purpose of reshaping old assumptions and approaches into new understanding for the future of the Middle East. This is envisioned to be a collaborative effort of several think tanks in a much needed time for a region that impacts all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have a few minutes for uh, discussions, but let me uh, start the discussion by, well, one remark and one question. The remark is that now many planners, policy planners or think tankers are experts of the United States. I mean, outside the United States, for instance, here, I think you, Dr. Khalid, you are an expert in the United States. Uh, uh, Oleg Stepanov, who will be, uh, will talk in a few minutes, is an expert in the United States. Henry Wong is an expert in the United States. So, uh, I would say we are, you are all experts in the United States, and the United States is away today. So my simple question to both of you is, since think tankers and policy planners are supposed to influence, to be influencers, to what extent do you influence the United, the, 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 the American administration today? Uh, to, uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, it's actually uh, an existential question, really, for the Council on Foreign Relations, because um, uh, CFR has, for, has long had tattooed across its forehead the word establishment, and so we, uh, my office in Washington is um, two blocks from uh, the president's um, White House, and uh, there's a real question of impact and evidence, I mean, uh, and relevance, because of course the Council on Foreign Relations um, is, it has Democrats, Republicans, and Independents as its members, but all of us are in fact, um, are, are in fact internationalists. So it has been difficult. Um, we, there are certain pe members of the administration who we have had access to, certainly, uh, but when you are 
facing an administration and a president who frankly is has a non-multilateral back to the future uh, uh, at ethos who is basically in a sense um, and it's very timely in, the, in, this, in this anniversary of the, of, uh, of the armistice, who has basically a pre-1941 isolationist America first agenda. It's something that uh, we, we continue to fight against uh, in terms of trying to reaffirm the, uh, uh, the United States' enduring stakes in, in an effective multilateral system. And that multi, you asked about multilateralism earlier, and I didn't address it enough. There are several different areas in which we are emphasizing multilateralism. First of all, that international institutions are capable of being renovated, and that is one way to get over the skepticism of certain people, perhaps not John Bolton, but certain people in the administration to say, no, the United Nations is capable of reform, and certain agencies are capable of reform. World Health Organization can do better. Another thing that we have been looking at is that multilateralism is not just traditional intergovernmentalism. Increasingly, it in includes minilateral cooperation, which can be much more effective. It is not a substitute for charter-based organizations of the sort that we heard talk yesterday, but it is something that, that works. Another aspect is multi-level governance, too. One of the things that's been quite exciting to see, despite the United States pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, which is a disastrous decision on many levels, is the fact that within the United States, states and localities, so a state like California, for instance, they have taken the lead in saying we are still in the Paris Accord, and in fact, much of the relevant policy happens at the municipal level in the organization that um, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, former Mayor Bloomberg runs, uh, but also uh, in, in states. And so CFR has been engaging at the sub-state level too, uh, because we don't always have the open doors. Is, is Trump uh, uh, aware of your existence? <laughs> he definitely is aware of our existence. Um, there's no question. And actually, um, the, I, the last book that I wrote, um, uh, which is, was called About Sovereignty, it's called The Sovereignty Wars, Reconciling America with the World, and it was an argument against the hyper-sovereignist approach that, that the Trump administration was taking. And I have it on good authority that at least the previous national security advisor actually said that he read the book. The current national security advisor, I do not believe, is going to read that book. <laughs> Khalid. Uh, when uh, President Trump uh, left uh, Iyad after his very famous trip to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and when I think he was flying and he found that MBS uh, uh, decision to isolate Qatar was a great decision, uh, do you think he was, uh, he knew where Qatar lied, and do you think he knew that the United States had uh, uh, American uh, military assets in Qatar? I think uh, the important question, what narrative has been presented, um, not to the administration, but also to the wider, um, to the wider scene, I think, in Washington and others, and this is the narrative which I have mentioned in my talk, and it's the narrative that uh, I'm trying to portray a country which is uh, Qatar, a small country, that uh, it has been falsely accused uh, for supporting uh, terrorism, for instigating uh, opposition groups, and um, I think there has been a lot of, of, of misleading, of misleading um, information given. But the point is that the narrative that was presented by these countries, I think they positioned themselves within a narrative that they are for change and for progress, and that they are espousing um, ideals not only in their countries but in the region that will match those expectations of, the, of, 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 of uh, not only the public but think tanks and policymaker circles. So I think in that sense, um, what, when we warned about the crisis in the beginning of, of, of uh, about the implication of this crisis, it was saying that actually this will lead to further instability. And Unfortunately, uh, some think tanks, uh, also media in the beginning, have followed the accusations and have more actually irritated some of the lines. And it's only with lengthy engagements, I think from our side with the think tanks in DC, with, with the media, with the diplomatic efforts of all the government in Qatar that we have been able to really clarify this issue. But the question remains, why did all the, why did think tanks, why did policymakers buy for some time 
into this narrative? And the, I think the answer is because it's, it played to certain assumptions and uh, it played to certain uh, values. And the, these countries, the blocking countries, have abused action, uh, the, the whole thing, and the good intention to, to project themselves against Qatar, but also in the wider regional uh, uh, project which they have been embarked on, which only has shown uh, was detrimental and has worked against uh, the region and stability in the region. Thank you very much. Time is going too fast. So who would like to ask a question? Uh, Sausan Asfari, the Asfari Foundation. But I sit on the board of a small think tank called the US Middle East Project, and we work closely with the European Council on Foreign Relations. You, you want think tanks to think out of the box. How do we manage to have independent policies when all the time the think tanks, especially in Washington, are trying to fundraise, whether from governments or individuals? How do you um, keep that line where you can have neutral reporting or neutral projects without it being influenced by the funder? This is well, uh, I, I think the two, uh, our two friends have ideas, but I, I have one too. I mean, this, how is it possible not to be funded? You know, that's, that's an eternal problem, but anyway, Stuart. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a perpetual problem. Uh, some think tanks are in a, a more favorable position than others, particularly, it's very fortunate, like if you're the Council on Foreign Relations, you have a, quite a large endowment. It's also, um, very fortunate if you are a think tank in the United States, and if you're a quality think tank in the United States, it's quite possible to get to found, there are so many foundations, and there's that, that tradition of philanthropy in the United States that makes it easier. In other countries, for instance, our, our partners in the Council of Councils, for instance, many of them are funded directly from the government, right? In some cases, that's not a problem. In some cases, it, there's much more, there's much less independence that goes on. But even in the United States, we have, have had, and there have been a number of newspaper articles, we've had instances where the research is really direct at being funded either directly by a government or by a corporation or by an individual that has, as we say in the United States, an ax to grind, a specific ax to grind. And if they, if, if you don't, get uh, the, the kind of response or the kind of direction of research uh, uh, that, 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 that the donor is looking for, then you're not going to get money next time. So it is a, it is a real issue uh, and, it's, and it's a constant one. And I think one of the keys is diversifying your sources of income so that you are not as reliant on any particular donor. So if that donor says, oh, I'm done with you, then you actually still have the opportunity to keep operating. But it is, the money chase is, is, is very difficult. I acknowledge one, that. One word, really, than this issue of fundraising. Um, I'd just like to say that, for example, we do have think tanks in Doha for many years, and uh, for example, we have some relationship with think tanks. But you can go and ask any think tanks, all the universities we have, uh, in contrast to some, some of the blockading countries which have closed think tanks and dictated uh, uh, projects, we have not done that at all. And uh, I challenge anybody to go and ask about, about that and to see that if we have actually been setting agendas for any of the think tanks uh, in Doha or that we have actually tried to constrain them or direct them in any way. So I think it's important to know also who we are partnering with. Well, thank you. Anyway, this is a fundamental question, and all of us are thinking a lot on, 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 on this. So now, unfortunately, time is going too fast, so thank you very much, both of you. And uh, I am going to call for the second third of uh, this panel. Um, I'm going to call first Mrs. Uh, Mati Niku O'Brien, who is... Uh, former executive director of New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, and uh, Sebastian Groth, uh, who is the deputy director of the policy planning staff in the Auswärtiges Amt in uh, Germany. So uh, what we are going to uh, talk uh, about now is uh, the uh, issue of the relations with media because, again, you know, one of the key words is influence, influencers. All of us wants to be, to exert influence, and influence very often goes through media. And by the way, there is also an issue of uh, fundraising or a financial issue with media, you know, advertising and all that. So, um, you should first, I should first. Um, 
First of all, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation and congratulations to the organizers of this Peace Forum. I think it's already a big success. I was really impressed by the opening yesterday. And I'm looking forward to, to two days of, of good discussion and, and exchange. Um, so I just want to make three very brief points. Um, first is, I think, for for us in, in the policy planning, but in the German government uh, uh, in total, the, the media is a very, very important partner for us. The media is indeed not the enemy of the people, but it uh, fulfills a very, very important uh, function within the society, but also in foreign policy as a bridge builder and as, a, as an interpreter of um, foreign policy for the German public. We are still in Germany in the position to have a very, very broad network of international correspondence uh, in, for our media. And um, that's also, I think, one of the reasons why in, in general the German public is is relatively well informed about um, global developments and also very interested in global developments. Um, I started my career in Kenya uh, 15 years ago and was responsible for the German press there. And um, I personally also benefited a lot. Um, um, I think um, good reporters, got good re correspondents are um, sometimes better informed than even good diplomats. So we can learn very, very uh, much uh, from each other and um, should see this as an enriching partnership. Um, second point, though the partnership is, is close, um, there are some challenges because the modus operandi and the logic um, um, how these worlds function is a bit different. Media is under pressure to simplify um, the message, whereas, um, as we've seen yesterday in the first openings, the things that we are talking about here with regard to global governance and multilateralism are extremely complicated, complex, with different interests and stakes at stake. Uh, so there you see a certain tension. And the second tension, I think, is uh, the sequencing, the timing. Media is moving extremely fast, um, now counting in, in minutes or even seconds after an important event, whereas policy processes, especially in the realm of policy planning, are talking about the mid and longer term um, developments. So we have sometimes to bridge this gap between the very, very short term media perspective and the medium to long term perspective in, in relevant um, policy issues. Um, my third point um, is um, um, what we can do as foreign policy practitioners, as foreign ministries. Um, I think um, we should um, um, increase our support for um, um, the international media presence and the freedom um, of the media um, generally. Uh, in Germany, um, we are partnering with a lot of NGOs worldwide, Reporters Sans Frontières, uh, for example, and other NGOs. We have um, set up a program for journalists under pressure abroad that can come to Germany and um, do a sort of um, um, sabbatical um, um, in, in, in Germany, um, so to, to give them um, a sort of, of, of protection. Um, but um, I... Um, I um, also think that um, within our societies, um, we have to look at um, um, the role of, of the media in the difficult um, discussions that we have right now about um, populism and about uh, echo chambers, dialogues within the society. So what can we do to um, guarantee a high degree of um, um, quality within the media? What can we do against uh, deep fake um, um, uh, modification of facts uh, and figures uh, that erode trust within our societies. And most of our societies in the Western world, at least in, in Europe, are based upon trust and, um, and, um, and, and facts. And I think if, if media becomes part of this game, um, uh, things get, get uh, really very, very difficult. And the last point probably is that I would like to um, mention one thing that the German Foreign Ministry is doing end of November. There is um, the so-called Freedom Online Coalition um, that gathers uh, 30 governments that came together 2011, first time in the Netherlands, to support um, 
um, ideas like uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of information, also on the in the realm of the internet. And we will host um, the next conference on the 28th um, of November in Berlin. And we are very um, happy and to welcome you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to speak uh, at the first Paris Peace Forum. And coming from far away, New Zealand, I'm very grateful to be invited to speak here. Um, I'm here to tell you about why I believe that the media is so crucial in our mission uh, at think tanks. My talk focuses on the themes of relevance and perspective. And I will color my talk through the lens of my three-year tenure as executive director of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs, or NZIA in short, uh, which I just completed three, uh, two months ago. New Zealanders' well-being resides on a good understanding of the world. We are an outward-looking, open nation that relies on rules and trade with our partners to survive. The maxim, trade or die, is often heard in our parts. And in the 1930s, after, great, after the Great Depression, this message hit home. New Zealanders of all stripes were affected, but few understood why. And so the NZIA was founded. It was one of the oldest institutes of foreign affairs, created before the very foundation of the United Nations and of a New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So the founders were visionaries. They saw and explained why world happenings uh, matter to New Zealanders. That need is so important today as it was back then. And that need can only be served to all Kiwis through a channel. We are a partner, that is to say, the media. But like elsewhere, today the media is being completely disrupted by digital technology, alternative news sources, social media, and short news circles. Well, some may say, what does the media, why does the media matter? Well, I will take my tenure at the Institute as an example. When I joined in 2015, the Institute suffered from a lack of visibility, a reputation as a club for retired diplomats. Actually, I was the first woman a director of the Institute in 82 years. New Zealand has had um, about three female prime minister, but the Institute didn't have any woman on board. Um, this being said, uh, the Institute uh, produced journals, edited, published books, and had visiting speakers. This output resonated well in international relations and political science circles, but, few, uh, but with few others. There were few indigenous Maori voices, few women voices, few young voices, few missing voices, full stop. Too much consensus and debate was planned years in advance, simply too out of step with current news. The vast majority of New Zealanders switched off and hence, was in and hence the Institute was in slow decline. But the Institute's founding vision was the complete opposite. The vision was about inclusiveness, breaking the mold, fresh thinking, expl explanation of the, to the public of what's happening. And for this part, the media is key. The media is a way to scale the public debate. Um, in a liberal democracy, media play a key role. Um, you know, the, um, the whole democratic representatives to account uh, on the decision. And so for questions of world affairs, the media is the channel, the, the public use to hold our representatives to account. But others might say, why even try when fake news make error, you know, is here and uh, erodes traditional media. Fake news has, be has been around since the advent of the printing press. Not all media is created equal. And think tanks can help combat fake news and stay relevant. Think tanks can build their reputation and trust of well-respected media 
at the institute, we concentrated on two things, on doing, sorry, on doing things really well, staying relevant and bringing perspective. To be relevant, one must listen and be adaptable. Listen to what is happening in the world. To, um, for instance, at the height of the nuclear tensions in, with South Korea in September 2017, we were able to coax the ambassadors of China, the United States, South Korea, and Japan onto one panel in front of a packed house of 300 people for a public debate. It took tact, perseverance, and persuasion to make this happen. And as commented by the panel chairs, it even could not have happened anywhere else in the world. It brought perspective, so it attracted coverage in the media. In a similar vein, at the height of tensions with Iran in 2014, where the media was in a frenzy about sanctions and looming war, I we were able to have heads of missions of both Iran, Iraq, and the United States together. So this perspective is essential, and the impact through the media can be huge. Um, so I'm just, I, I think I'm, I'm over. So in summary, I see the media, including social media, as a vital partner to think tanks. The relationship is mutually beneficial. The media are the vector to make a great to make the great questions of world affairs acceptable to all. We, in our discipline, provide the insight and perspective that they sometimes lack. The combination of relevance and perspective is hugely powerful to making people care and debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we have some time for debate. Let me ask the two of you again one simple question. Uh, because we are, of course, when we talk about think tanks, we are thinking here of think tanks on international affairs, but there are also think tanks which deal with uh, other aspects of public life. So my question is, you mentioned well, public debate, but in your own experience, is there really much public debate on international affairs? I mean, public debates on international affairs as such, not hidden domestic affairs, because, uh, well, typically, you know, in electoral campaigns, at least my own experience, is that foreign affairs plays a very, very limited role, uh, if any. So how do you uh, approach this uh, question? We're in Germany. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this question. I think it is, um, a constant uh, challenge for foreign ministries um, to reach out and um, engage uh, the public in a debate about foreign and European um, policy. In Germany, we started a process, um, a review process of our own um, setup um, and outreach, um, and um, we developed um, basically two new uh, formats and instruments. Um, one was that um, we organized and still organize a series of meetings um, and, and public debates like this one here, where diplomats go out um, in medium-sized cities all over Germany and the Foreign Office is partnering with the local newspapers in Regensburg or um, in Bremen. Um, these newspapers are organizing debates. We have lots of people, 150, 200 people at, at each of this session. And then the newspaper reports about this discussion. So this is one, one very successful tool. Another tool that we um, 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 explored is, um, is social media. Um, and the establishment of a blog um, about um, about foreign policy, and um, we are surprised by the reactions of the public. So um, I think our expectations at the very beginning was were not very very high, but in fact there was a very lively uh, debate, and we somehow fed in uh, contributions by the minister or by prominent politicians from from Germany. So this this always triggered a sub debate on this blog, and, and it was a quite successful um, 
um, project and we want to um, uh, develop it further and um, especially with a focus on uh, what we call in Germany uh, Alliance for Multilateralism where um, we would like to engage with the German public um, uh, and hear their ideas about Germany, German's role, Germany's role in, in a renewed multilateralism. But for, for, for instance, you know, when Angela Merkel became Gaullist, mm -hmm. I mean, when she said that perhaps Europe should uh, realize that we, uh, they cannot depend forever on the United States, there's things like that. Is there a real debate on this matter today in Germany? I mean, is, uh, is it not just only words from the chancellor, but is it starting to be really, really debated? I would say yes. It is. Um, it is um, debated in in Germany. Um, um, I have to admit that it's all under um, the perspective of what is happening in the United States. But uh, for example, I. Saturday I buy my newspaper at the kiosk around the corner and every time I buy my newspaper there the the guy Who's selling it and I'm reading Saturday? I'm reading the Süddeutsche Zeitung all over the week. I'm reading the Frankfurter Allgemeine So this is a mixture um, of political perspectives and he is always complaining Why are you buying this newspaper that is so critical with Donald Trump? So then we start to discuss and um, you see it's 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 really trickling down um, I would not say that it's the strategic depth of the debates and what is the German role now in the 21st century in reacting to this, but the debate begins and I think um, two or three years down the road uh, we will be there. Matti, can you give at least one example of a real debate in your country, which is a real debate, I mean, that is really international? So, so um, the, okay. Um, we talk about tyranny uh, uh, earlier, one of the colleagues spoke. In New Zealand, we have the tyranny of distance. That means we are so far away from the world. It's one of the challenge we had at the Institute was to, to make un people understand that what's happening outside of New Zealand has an impact for New Zealanders. Um, we have had many, uh, many interesting debates. Um, just to give you an example was one, we, org we are, sorry, just before, we are a community-based institute. So most of our activities are around uh, debates, events. Uh, one of the debate we had was uh, just before uh, the Iran deal. And we made sure to invite all stakeholders. We had a speaker, um, a scholar from Israel, one from Iran, one from the US, from Europe. And of course, we had uh, experts to give us a New Zealand perspective. And because we, we, we were neutral, we just wanted to have opposing views or different perspectives so that people make their own choice. And we believe that it had an impact on New Zealand foreign policy making because at that time New Zealand was to, about to put on sanctions on Iran. But then it changed. Um, the former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of New Zealand chaired actually the resolution at the UN Security Council, the, two, uh, three, four, the resolution 234. So, you know, by being independent, um, foreseeing the challenges, and bringing different voices to um, different perspectives, I think we, we can be trusted and, uh, you. you know, um, be Thank relevant. You. Thank you very much. As a think tank. So, who would like to shoot now? I think the big question for think tanks is whether policy these days is subject to influence through research because that's traditionally what think tanks have done. And in these days, policy is more and more shaped by opinion, by all of the media debates you've both been discussing. But is research, which is ultimately supposed to be the, the preserve of think tanks, is it actually having an impact in, in your practical experience? Would you no. I would say yes, probably not as much as it should, but um, you know, we in, in, in Germany um, have a small budget in policy planning to commission studies, for example. One, one year and a half ago, we commissioned a study about demographics in Western Africa. Um, um, so um, an, an institute um, based in Berlin teamed up with an institute in Vienna and they looked into six Western African countries and the relationship between basic education and demographic trends and they developed a sort of model how to project uh, demographic trends with regard to investment in primary education. 
And um, well, I would not overestimate the, the, the relevance of this study, but at least it helped us in arguing internally um, in Germany, first in the ministry and then with our fellow ministries of cooperation and finance and economics, um, to look more into this issue. And um, I think, you know, this at least is a small element where, where scientific research helped us to give you a strong, to give us a strong argument in um, in our internal debate, and now we we are in the next stage. Would like to lift this debate also to the European level. Shortly. Yes. So we are fed by what's you know the research mark kind of research market, but our role is also to be a bridge between knowledge and power and translate that to. Uh, to a different audience, uh, general public, media, uh, scholars, uh, decision makers, but also future decision makers, younger generations. So I, I, I will give my own answer to this, uh, which is definitely yes. Uh, for instance, at IFRI, you know, we have very strong experts on uh, regional experts, for instance, on Russia, on China, on the transversal themes such as energy, you know, uh, uh, or there's some demographic aspect you refer to uh, and others. And uh, you, you really have to have very good experts uh, to clarify uh, what we are talking about and to distinguish between uh, vague narratives and opinions and ideology and uh, factual uh, realities. So the, the answer is, uh, I think, definitely uh, yes. As far as political recommendation is concerned, that's, that's a, a different uh, topic. So uh, thank you. I think uh, it's the end. I, well, well, I think three minutes, 56 seconds more. I think normally it's, it's, uh, the sequence is finished normally, I think. So thank you very much, both of you. And we will switch to the last uh, uh, to the last segment. Which is, uh, which is uh, what difference is between policy planners and think tanks. We are back to the, to the, uh, uh, to, to the introduction uh, to this uh, panel with Oleg Stepanov, who is the uh, director of the Russian policy planning staff. And uh, Henry Wang, who is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. So b b before I, I give the floor uh, to the speakers, uh, let me tell you why we had the nasty idea uh, to put uh, one person from China and one from Russia to discuss the difference between uh, policy planners and think tankers. Because I think if, it, if we were in the, about talking about the United States, the distinction would be much clearer. In, uh, well, China and Russia are great democracies, of course, but nevertheless, they are not exactly the same kind of democracy as in the United States. So the difference between uh, the two sorts of institutions is probably uh, somewhat different from the difference between similar institutions in uh, democratic, in liberal democratic countries. Hence, the, the, that's the reason why we put the two of you in this to discuss this, this issue. So uh, let's uh, start, for, in, for instance, with, uh, with China. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. And uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Paris Peace Forum. Uh, it's an excellent uh, platform for all the elite uh, get together and then talk about the hot issues. It was really a great start. Uh, this, this section is about think tanks role and also policy makers, what's the interaction and the difference. I'd like to t uh, say that in two front. First is uh, on, on a domestic front. I think these days, for example, I can take example, you talk about China is a little different and uh, China actually now is in, in a think tank boom uh, stage. I think the, 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 the government is also now much more uh, encouraging the think tanks. There's about uh, you know, 600 think tanks in China, and uh, my think tank, Center for China and Globalization, we, we found about 10 years ago, right after the Beijing Olympics, 
uh, which by then the slogan was one, one world, one dream. So it's a globalization center for China. But we actually we found that think tank has a lot of role to do in China. For example, uh, uh, you, you have a traditionally uh, a system there have been 60 years, some years, 70 years in China. But then think tank actually provide the new layers of uh, 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 so-called grassroots, maybe uh, provincial and central level to promote uh, the, the you know scientific and democratic decision making. So so I think for example we actually CCG my think tank we have uh, done quite a few things now. For example, we recommend China in, on the globalized front. We have encouraged China to join the IOM in another organization of migration. China has been 15 years of, as an observer. Uh, in 2016, China joined that and now becomes second largest donor of IOM. So really play China's role there. And also uh, the, one of the things we have done is I, I personally wrote a proposal. To the, to the top leaders in China, that China should have a Department of Immigration uh, in, in 2016. So this year, China actually set up a, a ministry called the National uh, uh, Immigration Administration, so that you can show think tank actually does play some role there. And, um, and my think tank, actually, uh, uh, which I founded about 10 years ago, is, is, a, is a private independent think tank, and we actually have a, most of our funding from, uh, from private sectors. So, so I think that, that domestically, but, but coming to the, uh, to, the, to the multilateral level, I think think tank these days is really crucial because we, we've seen yesterday, I heard uh, a president of IRO said uh, they are the only uh, organization that pr existed uh, uh, you know, after the First World War. But after the Second World War, we have actually uh, a flower, you know, the globalization 1.0. We have United Nations, we have a World Bank, we have IO, IOM, we have WTO. Actually has sustained the peace and the stability of the world, and, the, and the, we have, we, the world has been prosperous for the last seven decades without major Third World War. So that's, I think, that's precisely because of multilateralism, because of think tank I interact with them. Uh, so, so I think the think tank will probably play more role in a global affairs rather than domestically. So these days, if a, global, if a think tank is not playing global affairs, probably it's not playing enough role. So that's why I'm thinking now. Now we are getting into globalization, deglobalization, and we have the present trauma, we have the, all those brace exit and all those issues. So how can we sustain the momentum of the last seven decades continuously into the next seven decades of peace and prosperity? That's exactly think tank and multilateral should play. For example, I think that uh, multilateralism, uh, now we should have a you know, globalization 2.0. We now have a G20. We now have, uh, 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 you know, that uh, uh, also uh, China has set up AIB. We have uh, uh, all those uh, new uh, thinking that uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So I think how to improve, how to enhance and add on the globalization 1.1 uh, uh, is really uh, important, 1.0. So, so for that purpose, I think that uh, now we see the, uh, uh, the, you know, the policy makers of a different country, multilateralism, sometimes don't talk to each other. For example, China and the US now is, is facing these uh, trade frictions. Uh, if you want to say trade war, it's also possible. But, but what, what actually can be done is, for example, at the G20, can, we can the think tanks have track to dialogue, really get these uh, uh, issues, you know, maybe a, a kind of a rich consensus? Like we did, CCG, we went to Hudson Institute. We did a, had, had a half-day event with Hudson Institute and president there. We talked about China U.S. trade differences and how we can solve them. So I think think tank does play a role in terms of shaping the uh, multilateralism, in shaping the global gov governance, and also helping to uh, form the, 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 the best ideas and best practice for the globalization continue forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, and you saved uh, two seconds. So, uh, uh, Oleg, you're the, you're the, the five minutes? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. Even though you are Chinese, <laughs> no, no. The, the, we, you're the currently the director of the policy planning staff of the MID. Uh, how do you interact with uh, think tanks in uh, there are a number of think tanks in uh, in Moscow? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I had prepared introductory remarks, but I believe it would be better just to interact and communicate. Uh, actually, we uh, have quite robust uh, interaction with our think tanks, and you know that the Russian academic and think tank community is huge. And uh, in our policy planning department, initially, 
there are at least two sections that deal directly with the uh, external thinking process, right? So we have a specific desk to interact with um, academic institution and think tanks, both domestic and foreign. And we also have an analytical desk that uh, follows the trends, uh, that analyzes uh, major reports published by most respectable international think tanks. So in order to digest and to see the trends uh, in foreign policy thinking. Uh, at the same time, we um, have two uh, great established institutions, which is uh, Moscow State International uh, Relations Institute, my alma mater, Mr. Turkunov, who is the rector, you know him very well, and the Diplomatic Academy. And both of those institutions, they are not only educational institutions, they also have a, uh, quite a number of analytical uh, think tanks and uh, uh, study centers in there. Uh, with them, uh, we interact, we commission reports from them. It's uh, about uh, 150 reports each year that we receive from those both institutions. Uh, but we do not fund those reports. Uh, when they uh, prepare the reports and when they produce the reports, they are funded by the state budget. So it's a kind of neutral money that, we, uh, that uh, they, they use. Uh, other two institutions I would mention is uh, Russian Council on Foreign Relations, headed by our foreign, former foreign minister, Mr. Igor Ivanov. Uh, uh, my minister gives them probably about 15% of financing, and the rest uh, of the money is independent sponsors. And uh, also the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, which is completely uh, independent uh, assembly of academicians of from different political spectra, both oppositional and, and pro-governmental, right? Uh, so uh, in order to help us to be more fresh and flexible in policy planning, we very often um, conduct a closed session of brainstorming on particular issues. We also have uh, a wonderful format which is called the Expert Council by the Foreign Minister. Uh, this body uh, is semi-official. Uh, the council uh, meets uh, uh, twice a year. Uh, the minister is presiding. We usually uh, present a topic in advance for the academicians to consider. And it's a free discussion without any formalities, without any protocol. So it's a, just a gathering of people who want to discuss a particular actual topic of um, international policy. And uh, as of my minister, Mr. Lavrov, he always welcomes the uh, dissent opinion or the critics sometimes we hear from the academic community. And it's, it's really very useful because it stimulates the thinking process and uh, it helps us not become too rigid uh, to, uh, to maintain that intellectual uh, flexibility. And uh, within that uh, scientific council by the minister, we, um, it's, it's about, about uh, 30, 30 uh, prominent experts, both independents, they include also academics, heads of uh, uh, regional institutions uh, of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, also being a, in a policy planning, uh, we are supposed to come to the events like this, or independent uh, gathering uh, on, uh, on different topics in, in, in other countries, presenting our opinion, of course, and uh, sometimes getting uh, uh, and input back from, from the academic community, and I believe it helps uh, also to kind of be on top of the, of, of, of the trends. And uh, as a department, we uh, maintain very open door policy, so we are always open for diplomatic or expert community, foreign academicians, foreign experts, foreign representatives of think tanks to come and to discuss, or sometimes uh, foreign experts need to get uh, an information uh, on a broad scope of Russian foreign, foreign policy and that we can help in explaining or uh, conveying that. I know we are out of time, I just wanted to mention that uh, when we were preparing uh, the recent edition of uh, our foreign policy concept, the uh, first thing that we did, we consulted with all the prominent experts in, in Russian academic community, received the ideas, many ideas were put into the concept. And I believe uh, such interaction, it helps uh, to that our foreign policy um, reflects the broad scope of uh, opinion in the society and uh, makes it more predictable and more, uh, more kind of foreseen 
in, in a sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will ask the first question to the two of you. Uh, as before, uh, when uh, Donald Trump was elected uh, President of the United States, uh, all of us over the world uh, tried to understand, uh, well, how we would behave and uh, how we could reduce uh, uncertainty uh, for predicting uh, American uh, foreign policy. So my question is, uh, do you think, the two of you with your experience, that you helped to uh, understand uh, Trump uh, better? Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> actually, um, we know President Trump was in town uh, yesterday, and uh, uh, he has actually he has been always a very unique style in in terms of uh, 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 you know exchanging with the world. But I think you know the the the, the Trump phenomena is not uh, uh, really it probably is still the symptom. I mean the roots of the of the issue is that. Uh, uh, the deglobalization has been going on for some time, and uh, the first generation of the globalization has actually met a lot of uh, uh, challenges and difficulties. So how, to, how, sh how should we address that, I think, is that precisely uh, think tanks and multilateralism should really be uh, improved. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that now we're talking about, I mean, President Trump serves as a wake-up call. We, we are now serving, seeing that uh, we we'll talk about WTO reform. We we'll talk about zero tariff alliance between U.S., Europe, Japan. We are seeing TPP is, is taking shape. Uh, China may likely probably uh, also be interested. I, 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 we would recommend China to be part of TPP as well. So, so we see new multilateral is, is taking shape, and uh, President Trump serve as a catalyst probably for us to think about those things, and then. So, so I'm very hopeful that uh, President Trump and President Xi, as mentioned, are going to meet in the G20. They're going to talk about uh, issues. They're going to, so that uh, the working team is, is working. Uh, 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 Councillor Mr. Yang was in Washington just, just last week talking to uh, Secretary Pompeo. So, so I, I'm sure you know, there, we will try to find out the issues, uh, uh, you know, try to solve the differences. But what I'm thinking is that the, uh, the think tanks is really important. Like, uh, you know, uh, CCG, Center for China Globalization, we were in Washington at the end of September. We visited the 17 think tanks. We went to Council of Foreign Relations, Heritage Foundation, AEI. We had a half the event at the Hudson Institute. So according to the president of Hudson Institute and also Michael Fusberg there said, in our report we released at Washington regarding the sign of U.S. trade frictions, it's on our website, he has reported that to the White House. So. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. Think Tank does play some role. We, on, on, this, on the same thing in, within China, we've been promoting free trade, we've been promoting uh, you know, liberalization of trade, we're performing all those things. So I think it's really important that uh, we can play those roles. Thank you. Well, uh, this question was about uh, kind of projection of understanding of the Trump's or prediction. Increasing predictability. Yeah. In, increasing predictability. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Patrick here mentioned the revolving door, and uh, especially uh, it's typical for the uh, United States for DC, so with the change of administration, many people go into the think tank community where they can more openly express their views, and the uh, next administration come and uh, they're back in, in, in the White House and the administration in the State Department. So. Uh, all those figures are very well known, and so if you see them back in the decision-making process, you can predict the uh, way of uh, thinking of the uh, administration uh, that, uh, that is coming. Uh, the other uh, specificity probably unique to the Russian-American relations that we have uh, since, the, since the Cold War times, when not Russia but the Soviet Union was kind of uh, trying to square uh, itself with the United States on the international arena, we had the several uh, semi-closed dialogue on the second track or uh, one and a half uh, track uh, diplomacy with the participation of uh, Russian prominent uh, academicians and uh, experts, and that dialogue still continues and then gives the opportunity both for the U.S. administration and for the Russian government to receive 
uh, some understanding from the contacts between academicians and to kind of foresee or try to predict what to expect. Also, one of the out outcomes of the recent uh, Helsinki summit between uh, President uh, Putin and President Bush was a uh, proposal to try to create something like a uh, council of elders, prominent figures and academicians who will be able to have direct access high in the government, uh, meeting together and producing uh, advice uh, to both governments, but not advice on uh, what we need to do, because everybody in this auditorium probably knows what to do about Russian-American relations, but how to do it, how to improve it, how to stabilize it. And the, uh, that close communication between the foreign ministry, be between the think tanks of both countries is really helpful. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Let me just, I'm going to take a question from the floor, but let me uh, stress one aspect that was not mentioned, I think, so far. Uh, as I reminded at the beginning, you know, uh, policy planning staffs have one boss. The boss is typically the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you know. But uh, the counterpart of that is that they have access to insiders' information, which the think tankers do not do not have. So this is, uh, I think, an important uh, point also to, to, to stress. Uh, so who would like to take, please? Uh, Professor Ahmed Ouissal from Orsam Center for uh, Middle Eastern Studies in Ankara. Uh, I see a very good opportunity for think tanks, not only between uh, the governments and uh, civil society, but also between countries, in, uh, especially in the Middle Eastern context that we have so many conflicts and so many debates, uh, sectarianism, etc. I think uh, we, uh, the, the think tank to think tank communication and cooperation plays a, uh, can play a good role. Uh, for example, we are talking to both Saudi think tanks and Iranian think tanks, you know, for, uh, for better Middle East. And I just, but uh, the question is a little bit away from uh, my uh, topic, uh, I mean, for Mr. Oleg. Uh, I see a change in Russian policy in a little bit uh, uh, in, in Syria. I don't know how your think tank play a role in, in this to, to find maybe to, uh, from maybe uh, imposing a maybe a Russian type of solution to more cooperation with Turkey and now with France and Germany and international community. Thank you. Thank you. I would just in general, uh, probably you know that we, we have uh, a very strong uh, study school of Near East, and uh, it's especially relevant when we are talking about uh, Russian official involvement in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East, right? Uh, our department that deals with the regional issues has very real close, also almost family relations with uh, the Russian Academy of Science uh, Institute of uh, Near East, and uh, it probably would be an example we prominent thinkers really helped to formulate our policy. And it started uh, even before Mr. Primakov was our minister, who was an excellent expert himself in, in, in uh, Middle East studies and who actually helped to build that close, uh, close link between, uh, between the Russian academic community dealing with the region and, and, and the diplomats who sometimes uh, Sometimes they have very good experts in regional affairs as well. Sometimes they are bureaucrats, so they always always need that input from the from the academic community, especially when we are talking about such a sensitive uh, region as, uh, as Middle East. Thank you. So that was a question addressed to you, actually, to Oleg. Other uh, questions, please. We are transfer from industrial error into digital error. So the industrial thinking system and the governing model already outdated. I think the think tank should focus on new thinking systems and the governor's model. That's my comment. Thank you. No, I, would, I would like to add, actually, uh, talk about the think tank important. I, I think think tank probably is, is more, more relevant today than it used to be because uh, I just got out of uh, two days ago the Global Think Tank Summit at Brussels. And we have 8,000 think tanks across the world. But I think, you know, there's no think tank alliance. There's no think tank, global think tank association. So I think when, when first track have difficulty, when multilateral have a difficulty to, to reach agreement, think tanks, it, precisely, regional, global, maybe should also by sector, artificial intelligence or industrial or whatever, internet, we should have think tanks, the working groups, 
come up with solutions, even foreign policies that really have a lot of alternatives to provide to the to the policymakers to really make a great decision, sound decision, rather than just uh, you know among themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I apologize because other people would have liked to uh, ask questions, but I will conclude very briefly by repeating what I said at the very beginning. You know, in 1914, think tanks or policy planning organizations just did not exist. It is my view, and probably that of many of our community, that the existence of a strong networks of uh, think tanks and the relations with the policy planning organizations all across the world is a, a factor of stability. And it's extremely important uh, in uh, this uh, world uh, today where, as has been stressed uh, since uh, yesterday morning, and uh, as all of us know, uh, the risks of uh, fragmentation of the international system are, are very high. So thank you, all of you. Thank you very much. We are roughly on time, taking into account the fact that we started uh, a, a little late. Thank you very much. Thank you.